Hey guys, it's Mrs. Howard. I hope that you have your foldable that we set up in class so that you can take your types of graphs notes. If not, you need to make sure to get some notebook paper so that you can do that. Um, so let's get started, all right? All right, guys, so the first thing you want to do is title your notes. And so um, the title that we've got here is Types of Graphs. And we're going to go through about five different types of graphs here. Um, let's see, so let's go ahead to the first one. And the first type of graph that we're going to be dealing with, hopefully you know what type of graph that is. It is a bar graph, so make sure you label that tab. Okay, and let's go ahead and take our notes on bar graphs. All right. So obviously the first thing that you've got there is a bar graph. Uses either vertical or horizontal bars of different heights or lengths to display data. A bar graph has a scale and label so that the reader can tell what the bars represent. So um, if you look at the graph that you've got here, you've got labels and you've got a scale so that you can tell what this graph represents. Um, it says bar graphs are use useful for uh, comparing and organizing data. Comparing and organizing. All right, so in our graph, we've got Julie studying. On the x-axis, we've got the number of hours she'd studied, and then on the y-axis, the days of the week. And so you're supposed to make some general conclusions about this graph. So some of those could be, you can see that she obviously studied the most on Thursday. She studied the least on Friday. And you can even be exact saying, okay, looking at the graph or the bar for Monday, she studied three hours on Monday. And so just go ahead, take a little bit of time here and um, make some conclusions based on looking at that graph. All right, so the next graph that we are dealing with, let's see if you look at that graph, hopefully you know what type of graph that is. That is a line graph, so I'm gonna go ahead and label um, that on my foldable. And let's go ahead and take some notes on line graphs. All right, so on a line graph, the plotted points represent ordered pairs of numbers taken from the data being described in the graph, okay? It says line graphs are particularly useful for showing changes in data over a period of time. Okay. Line graphs are useful for showing changes in data over a period of time or showing trends, changes in data over a period of time. All right, so in this graph, we've got the water level of a river, um, and we've got the days of the week, and then on our y-axis, we've got the depth of the river in feet. And so some conclusions I may make are that, um, that the water level increased from Monday through Thursday and then decreased on Friday. I can tell that the graph was at its highest on Thursday. Um, I can see that the biggest increase where the line changes the most is between Tuesday and Wednesday. So a few different um, conclusions I can make. Again, make sure you take the time uh, to uh, make some conclusions and write them down in your notes. And then lastly, uh, there's a symbol there that means that there's a break in your axis. So um, just so you notice, the scale is in twos, but when you get to that point, um, from zero to 20 is a 20 jump instead of twos. And so it's just a way um, to show that there is a break in the graphing there. All right. And so then we're gonna move on to the next graph, which is a line plot. Okay. So line plot is our next type of graph. And um, first thing for your notes, a line plot or line plots organize data using a number line. Okay, 
They are used for data analysis, studying data, and making observations. All right, and so we're actually going to make this line plot because I don't know how many of you actually remember a line plot. So this is going to be about breathing rates. Notice we have our number line going from 10 to 16. And here's the data that we're going to use to make that line plot. Now with the line plot, all you do is mark an X every time you see that piece of data occur. So here we've got males and females. We've got a woman or a female that breathes 13 breaths per minute. So we're going to put an X there for 13. Okay. I've got a male who breathes 11 breaths a minute. So I'm going to put an X there for 11. I got another male here who breathes 13 breaths per minute. So I'm going to put another X because I have another 13 occurring. I've got a female that breathes 10 breaths a minute, a male who breathes 16 breaths a minute, a male who breathes 12 breaths per minute, a male who breathes 15 breaths per minute, a female breathing 13 breaths per minute, and another female breathing 13 breaths per minute. Okay, and so that's the way we make a line plot. We just put an X every time that value occurs. Um, some of the conclusions, you can make a really big um, conclusion. If you think about measures of central tendency, I can easily point out that the mode is 13, okay, because it's the one that occurs the most often. I can also easily identify the range, okay, because I can take my highest 16 minus my lowest 10, so 16 minus 10 gives me a range of 6. I can also um, see that no one had 14 breaths per minute. BPM breaths per minute. Okay. Um, and so those are just a few of the conclusions that we can make from looking at that line plot. Real quick, real easy. Okay, so you're plotting things on a number line with the line plot. Okay. All right, the next type of graph that we are going to discuss is a circle graph. Okay, and some of you also refer to this as a pie chart, and that is okay if you want to call it a pie chart. Either way, circle graph or pie chart. Okay. All right, and so starting out with our notes, a circle graph compares the numbers in a set of data by showing the relative sizes of the parts that make up the whole. Okay, so um, the circle represents the whole, which is made up of all the data elements, so all the pieces makes up the whole, the circle. Okay, each part of the circle represents part of the whole. Okay, this could also be each section of the circle or um, each slice, however you want to say it. But each part represents part of the whole. Okay. All right, so looking at this graph, I can tell that the whole orchestra is made up of 68 people. And I can tell that by adding up all the different pieces or sections of that circle graph. I can tell that... Um, Almost half of the orchestra is made up of violin players because the violin section takes up almost half of the circle. I can tell that obviously harp is the smallest section of the orchestra and that the cello and viola um, have the equal amount of players. Um, so just a few of the conclusions I can make. Make sure that you pause and get some of those conclusions written down in your notes. And the last graph that we are going to talk about is a stem and leaf plot stem and leaf plot okay. all right and notice there's a lot of information because this is probably a new graph for most of you hey okay, so the first thing in a stem and leaf plot in a stem and leaf plot the data are organized from least to greatest the digits of the least place value form the leaves and the next place value digits form the stems. Stem and leaf plots are useful for analyzing data because it shows all the data values. It shows all the data values. 
Okay. Okay, this includes, you can see the greatest, the least, the mode, and the median value. So the stem and leaf plot is useful because it shows all your data values. All right, and so we're going to make an actual stem and leaf plot. Um, I just... All right, and so here you've got a table that shows the average chick weight in grams of 16 different species of bird. Okay, and so our first um, step is going to be to choose our stems. And our stems are the tens digits, so 0, 1, and 2. So if you think about it um, like the number 5, well, it's tens digit. In front of that would be a 0. Okay, with the number 12, the tens digit is the 1. Okay, and 25, the ten digits is the 2. Okay, and so since these numbers only go from zeros to the 20s, our stems, when we make that stem and leaf plot, are going to be 0, 1, and 2. So those are our stems. Okay, next we've got to list the stems from least to greatest, which we just did in the stem column, and then we're going to write the leaves, which are the ones digits, from least to greatest. So um, we can start with our stems, or our ones that have a stem of 0. So that's 5, 6, and 7. Okay, so next to our stem of 0, we want to put the numbers 5, 6, and 7. So what that's saying is we've got the number 0, 5, 0, 6, 0, 7. Okay, um, so next, let's go to our digits that have 10 in the, um, or a 1 in the tens place. So you've got 10, um, looks like that's probably the smallest one. We've got two 11s. We've got one, two, three 12s, a 13, and a 19. Okay, so we need to place all of these in leaves. So with one, we had one 10, okay? We had two 11s, so I need to put a one for the first 11 and a one for the second 11. Okay, we're going to always write each leaf even if it repeats. So next we had three twelves, so I'm going to put three twos to represent twelve three times. Okay, uh, then we had a thirteen and we had a nineteen. Okay, all right, and then last we need to, oh, it looks like I missed an eighteen. There was an eighteen in there too. Okay. All right, and so last thing we need to do is take care of our 20s. So we've got 20, we've got 21 twice, and we've got 25. So 20, 21, 21, and 25. So 1, 1, and 5. Okay? And so just to make sure that you understand how to read this, think about what is your least number or your least chick weight here. Okay, well the least number is going to be the very first one you see, 0, 5, so the least is 5. Okay, what's our greatest chick weight? Okay, well the last one you see, 2 with 5, that means the greatest weight is 25. Okay, it's very easy also to see our mode here. Okay, um, which one occurs the most often? Well, I see three twos here, but remember that's not just two. I have to combine the one with the two to make 12. Okay, I can easily find my range, okay, because I can take my greatest, 25, minus my least, 5. So 25 minus 5 gives me a range of 20, okay? And so there's just a few of the useful ways to use a stem and leaf plot, okay? All right, so hopefully you have your full foldable done. All right, and you didn't have a summary to do today, but make sure that you have drawn some conclusions about each graph in your foldable. Have those written down. Come ready to work with graphs tomorrow.